Alan Miller, thanks a lot for coming in. Great to have you here in the Money Talk studio. Great to be here with you. Thanks, Liam. Ten years ago, Alan, there were around 50,000 pubs in the UK. In the first half of this year, that fell below 40,000. We're losing huge numbers of pubs, particularly during lockdown. Why should we care? Well, for many reasons we should care. One, it's because it's part of who we are and our life and uh, social integration. It's about where we go and fall in love. We meet people, we fall out, we discuss things, we row, we celebrate. Uh, and in fact, the the pub is one of the places that people hit, like come from around the world to come and see and experience. Uh, it's a place where people tell stories, they meet new friends, uh, and also where lots of new things are born, actually. And, you know, we've got all sorts of pubs and bars that now have music as well. And we know that that brings all sorts of things with DJs and other things, which is a big part of our GDP as it happens. And the multiplier effect of these things in our communities is such that it kind of generates all sorts of secondary and tertiary employment uh, and revenue. But at its core, it's a part of our fabric, our culture and, our, and who we are. And if you eliminate those things, it has a really detrimental impact on our whole way of life. You just demonstrated there, Alan, in a nutshell, that you are an evangelist for the hospitality industry, for the nighttime economy. We're going to come on to that. We're going to talk about all that in depth. But I'm going to ask you something um, that I've wanted to ask you for a while. Where does this come from? What is it about your childhood, your background, that basically you know, that makes you so passionate about the importance of that hospitality industry? Well, you know, I think the um, the thing is that I, Britain was very different when I was growing up. And I sometimes joke about it with some of the older police when, with the work that I've done. And they used to talk about Friday fight night and things like that. And there was a kind of different experience when I was growing up. But basically, you know, it's really important where people are brought together. And my experience from a very young age, from music and pubs and, and places is that it's a place that you can be tested. It's a place that you can have your ideas examined and people will tell you to be quiet. You have to, when I was growing up, you had to learn how to conduct yourself and behave yourself. And it was really important. It was like the place where you get your first drink, you become an adult, you know, you start exploring with dating and a range of different things like that. And it, I've seen the impact that it's had in terms of like where we live, the positive ones, also there can be negative ones if it's done in a certain way, right? We all know those old time places that used to be really bad. But what's so remarkable as well was that I grew up at a period where there was also a shift, which was, was bars and clubs and it, the, the whole experience of Acid House, which transformed Britain in many ways. I was there. Yeah, <laughs> along with other things. And it was a whole... Think. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun uh, and there were a lot of challenges. But all, it, what it really demonstrated is that I mean, this is the thing that we have to remind ourselves, like with the Jubilee and like with the Olympics, is that in Britain, and you might not think it anymore with the culture wars and this kind of like really, this nastiness that often seems to pervade uh, social media, but we're all fellow citizens. People want to celebrate together. They want to come together. And without sounding too evangelical, I think it's a really important point. And, you know, there is a thing, and this is not to, I mean, I think that religious congregation and getting together is really important. I support it. It's really important from a freedom point of view. But a lot of people don't do it anymore. So there's a secular kind of sense of getting together. There's also a problem in Britain about us really knowing who we are in many ways. And, and often just coming together, it, 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 be like, it tells lies to some of those things they say, right? So some people will say Britain full of really uh, chauvinistic, nasty, terrible people. And then you go out and you explore and you see that everyone's engaging with one another. Not like the old days where I'd be out where it really would kick off. But actually, you know, people are meeting. There's different languages, people, generations, perhaps not enough intergenerational. Like if you go to Asian night markets, right, mm. you see a range, you see. And even in, in Barcelona and places like that, there's often sort of a lot more older people. But I'm really passionate about it mainly because I see how it lights up our streets. It transforms areas. In those historical debates around planning between Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, you can end up like sort of having full dichotomies full splits because I think big planning is important sometimes but also really sort of small interesting activities important as well that's kind of grassroots and organic I think the thing is that you know when we came to I'll give you an example when we came to Brick Lane I've seen it in Liverpool and Brick Lane's of, a place in East London the place I first met you yeah. about 20 years ago I was yeah. pushing one of my kids down the street and you're yeah. standing outside the vibe bar you're alright mate <laughs> well exactly so the thing is that uh, 
the World Bank and others have cited um, that area in Tower Hamlets as an objective two area in terms of development, and meaning that it had lots of social problems. Mm. And uh, when we, so we kind of came along and put together a situation where you had a bar as a focal point, the vibe bar, where you had music and film and fashion, and then lots of activity around it. What then? And it became an iconic bar. You're being modest. It became an iconic bar. It was at the centre of a kind of revival of of East London. I mean. Decades ago, yeah, and well, thank you. And the, but the, and, and the World Bank cited it as an example of urban regeneration. Now that term is loaded with lot. You can have a big discussion about what regeneration means, but it tr it did transform things in the area, and people then cited it as an example of what to be done. And other cities emulated it and wanted to reflect it. And I've seen in many places, whether it's Ibiza. Las Vegas, love it or loathe it, right? Um, if you look at Nashville, if you look at different cities around the world, Amsterdam, Barcelona, there's a range of examples where night and day, hospitality, bars, drink, music, food, activity, it brings the best out of people, it lights up the cities, it brings people there. It's a reason why Sarah Tate, who's the managing director uh, of Mother Agency, which is one of our big ad agencies, right? Huge accounts globally, located in on the corner of Hackney and Tower Hamlets, right? In that mother building. The, the reason they did that is because the reason many want to be around activity like that, like Soho used to have so much appeal, yeah. is because they want to be, the best and the brightest want to be in an area that's interesting and dynamic and exciting. Not necessarily the most ritzy part of town. Not, not at all. And actually what's ha then happened is it transforms and it becomes different and you get all sorts of different activity happening there. And... And so councils and town planners and politicians have begun to realise this when some of the narrative around policy has all been about antisocial behaviour, bad activity, alcohol-related crimes, alcohol-related harms. It's almost like you take a think tank policy approach to being anti-public mm -hmm. and impose it on... When actually what we see is that in every respect, with all indicators, it transforms and improves things. Even when there are some problems, right? Even when there are some problems, the majority cost-benefit analysis is one that it delivers all round from an economic point of view, but from a culture and social point of view. So I'm passionate about it because it's also where I've met my greatest friends. It's I've seen the relationship between London Fashion Week and the dance floor. If you think about really from the mods onwards, right? But really the whole, from the, from the 50s and the 60s, there is no possibility of fashion without the dance floor mm -hmm. and music and clubs and that interface and that interaction. Uh, if you think about now, anywhere you go around the world, you can be sitting in a bar or a cafe having a great coffee or a juice or a great alcoholic drink and you'll hear dance music. And that, you know, that thing that a few people went to Ibiza to do, Danny Rampling and Nikki Holloway and those guys, that interface of those... And that explosion here is now a worldwide phenomenon. It's the cultural tapestry. We see hotels. We see, you know, the Ian Schragers coming out of Clubland and becoming dominant and having a contribution. We see tour operators, a range of different protagonists across the board. We have some of the best and the brightest professionals in this country that are leading the way with this. And so it's really, really essential. And that's why when we talk about some of the... Um, the the, the the great businesses that are going out of business for many reasons, we can come on to the reasons why. It's a tragedy uh, in many ways. We will come on to those pubs, those small and medium-sized businesses that we really like to focus on here uh, on Money Talks and in our Money Talks uh, interviews like this. You know, you and I, we're two gobby Londoners, but I know you care deeply about the hospitality industry, nightlife across the rest of the UK. And there are, of course, other huge hotspots, world-class hotspots with literally global reputations. You set up the Nighttime Industries Association, I think, back in 2015. You developed that network of nighttime industry czars, yourself in London, Sasha Lord in Manchester, uh, most famously. In How does the rest of the world look at Britain's nighttime industries look at our you know our dance scene our music scene our pubs and our clubs are we still as good as we used to be well um yes uh, yes and no I mean, yes in some ways we're better than we ever were before but in other ways we're more limited and one of the big challenges is licensing it's the fact that you uh, might have producers come from la to go in the recording studio and you come out at one in the morning you're like 
where do we go? Yeah. Or you go, um, yeah, uh, uh, there's a, you know, so in London, there's only a few venues you can go to after 2 a.m. That's an enormous problem for a so-called 24-hour yeah. city. Uh, you quite rightly said there's places like Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Birmingham, Glasgow. I mean, Glasgow is incredible. Sub Club and others. Nightlife in Belfast. I was in Belfast. Fantastic. In Glasgow. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Really good, partly because of the people, uh, partly because of the venues. Um, but we've got a problem, right, which is still a 1950s mentality uh, at, when it comes. If you think about people talk about globalization and the exciting destination hubs and and then there's a kind of this really disingenuous argument which is a bit like nimby-ish it's a bit like oh no we don't <laughs> want to do that it's a bit and the thing about great planning and curating things is that you work out quiet zones and beautiful parks mm. and serene areas which we all love right if you want to go in for a run and yoga and if you've got the kids young kids and, but you also think about Innovation, you've had triple glazing, you think about how you construct great buildings. By the way, we need millions more in this country of them, uh, as well as bars and clubs. And you could think of really, like I've gone around sort of advising different um, uh, council leaders and, and mayors, in Amsterdam, they have 24-hour destination hubs where people, young people cycle to those areas. But if you get property around there, it's clear that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you, you make an agreement and that you don't then start complaining if like in two or three years time you're- so The house was opposite a pub when you bought it. <laughs> exactly. No one forced you to buy it. Exactly. And we need to do all sorts of things like that, like have peppercorn rent to begin with or freehold availabilities for operators. So they grow whenever, because what happens is all these hospitality uh, entrepreneurs who are so fantastic, right? They make an area dynamic, exciting and expensive because people come there, want to be there and they get priced out. Mm -hmm. As we say, I say to, you know, council leaders, think about that in terms of your planning and quiet. And, and, but we've had to have major battles in Hackney. We had a major battle with a council that wanted to have all these kind of zones and impositions and restrictions. And you try to think, let, look, we know that you have to curate things, right? It doesn't mean that you're just saying that at every moment of the day, people have to be subjected to loud noise next to them. That's a silly, crass view. It's about curating. It's about a dynamic approach, leaving the entrepreneurs to be brilliant at what they do because they're phenomenal, but also saying these are the this is the context in which we want to see the direction of things go and work together. And we need to see a lot more of that. The, one of the problems in Britain and elsewhere globally, but particularly in Britain, is productivity. You know, you know you've written a lot about all these things, Liam, but... We have a real problem that we have sort of zombie companies a lot of the time that are kept in business. We have this kind of strange casino capitalism where they don't allow things to fail. But in this sector, we've got some of the most dynamic people, world leaders. Mm. Like we, you know, we've got the Harvey Goldsmiths. So we have um, concert arena people, festivals, uh, nightclubs, uh, technicians. DJs, musicians. We really are a superpower at this stuff, Incredible, right? Incredible, right? We export this, the GDP, it's enormous. There's soft power that Joseph Nye used to talk about. We've got, a but the problem is we've got legislators and people in licensing quite often uh, that see this as more of a problem. They only look at something one side of Something they've got to contain it. rather than something that is a source of wealth and joy. Absolutely. And prosperity. And that is the reason why we sort of all launched the Nighttime Industry Association in the first place. But there was an attack. Basically what happened was, and it's understandable, but I didn't understand it till I really got into this, was that if you say to the police, you've got to reduce cybercrime and paedophilia and terrorism, and by the way, we're cutting your resources by 40%, there's going to be an issue, right? Now, there is obviously an efficiency discussion, but, and then what then happened was and we only realized when sir bernard hogan house said it he said well you Former can boss of the match problem please. please he said well you can make money from clubs and bars and all that councils but if you want to get rid of crime you have to get rid of 50 percent of them and you're like sorry <laughs> and then i was like well thank you at least for now we know what we're dealing with yeah. right yeah. and what that was was there was a push a concerted effort to shut down licensed premises because of the concern of resource and overtime, which has all sorts of unintended consequences, by the way, as well for democracy, like insisting on lots of private security everywhere that are not um, actually subject to the democratic process in the same yeah. way the police are. Yeah. If you want to have Blackthorn everywhere on the streets or others, you know, it's a different kind of situation there. But, um, and we saw that, we saw the regulatory impulse on venues to become much more with private security, uh, with lots of CCTV cameras, IDs, metal detectors. It's almost like, whoa, we, like, we're not all becoming prisons. So you have this situation at a time, ironically, when everyone's much better behaved than ever before. Right, this is the other thing. People, I have, I still, when I'm at venues and that, I'm looking around, still saying sorry when you. The current generation of youngsters, they're not as leery as they we are, to use a London that. word, aren't they? They're not quite as bolshy. It's gone. There's not as much violence. Yeah. 
It's way gone. It's way gone. Now there's, you know, and unfortunately, I think there's a, an agenda to seek out intent and harm where perhaps you don't even see it as much, right? I think, you know, we've got a bit of that. The, the, the policy ideas seem to penetrate arenas where the public are in quite a lot, you know. So I think the thing is that, um, but internationally, just this is uh, uh, what... What happened was, if you look at somewhere like Berlin and Amsterdam, I actually brought the two key people from those two cities to the to the London to meet our current prime minister when he was mayor of the London to explain we need some kind of ambassadorial role for nightlife. And it's, and it's interesting because when people think everything is a conspiracy, what they said to us at the mayor's office was, was really interesting. They said, well, I was explaining, we, I brought a load of bar operators and club owners in there and they said, wow, we never knew all this was going on. This is a problem. They said, it's a bit like us when we say we want to have busking and we we get buskers out there and then the police arrest them and they, or they move them on. They But they're in charge of the police as well. And you realise that there isn't just, I don't like that term joined up policy, but that, that sense of a, a universal approach that you can execute and you get to everyone to understand and everyone's participating in it. And so I think the thing is that Around the world, they recognise how good it is, but we have a problem with licensing. And the thing, unfortunately, when you know uh, Sadiq Khan became uh, a mayor, we and and, of and London. yeah, and w when I say unfortunately, what I mean is that the the one thing that really needed to happen and change was twenty four hour licensing. We made that point consistently, and it's all very well having nice strap lines and having people do things and we but it hasn't happened here and there has been a push for some of it we did a um, nighttime economy forum and i said the two key things are you got to sit with the police and the council right they're the two key people that always and you know and, and initially the police were a little bit antagonistic but actually we got a real mutual trust because we would say things exactly as they were and they were in a difficult position but you need to have partnerships right and what they say and a lot of this good stuff got worked through and we spoke to people um, at the highest levels in government and uh, the local government association around the UK. We got training, people working together, speaking with the police, how things work. Um, you know, and, and very honest discussions about everything from alcohol to drugs to harms or not and who's responsible. And they, I think people are very open when you sit down and talk to them. But then what happened, you get a moment where you explain all those things and people are sort of bought in and they've be becomes part of their outlook and their approach which takes a lot of time. Yeah. And then we have a situation that, you know, a policy of lockdown, lockdown comes along yeah. and all of a sudden a lot of that hard work's lost and, and it eviscerates everything. Let's spend the rest of our time on, on lockdown, Alan. You did become pretty vocal during lockdown, uh, speaking out for the nighttime industries, the hospitality industry, which, of course, you know, were absolutely hammered by definition when we were all made to stay at home. You've outlined a lot in this interview, the big picture strategy, which is, of course, what you do. You are um, known as a leader of your industry, an advocate for your industry, your sector as a whole. At the more everyday level, what needs to happen to make sure we don't lose more pubs, we don't lose more clubs, so we can try and reverse this trend that I referred to at the beginning of this interview? Yeah, well... So in many ways, I stopped working it with the Nighttime Industry Association as much publicly a while ago, and I actually launched something called Open For All, which led on to the Together Association, which is kind of now the current incarnation of a mixture of people, because I think you can't just do it from the point of view of hospitality. Okay. You have to bring other business sectors in, uh, also people from a range of other areas that are kind of involved in everyone from teachers to others. Because in our community, and this is the thing about hospitality, it's part of a community and you have to get the neighbours and citizens all to buy into it and uh, the politicians, all what they call stakeholders. And I think that's really essential for a national conversation that everyone's on the same page. I like to present the idea when I talk to people to say, think about the Olympics or the Jubilee celebrations of the street parties. That's who the public are. That's who we are. When we were at our best and yeah. everyone's out there, it's not like, oh, everyone wants, like, oh, the crime, antisocial behaviour. It's a very tiny proportion and actually a lot of it is... And it's everywhere. That Exactly. It's daytime, actually. The big crime spots are daytime outside supermarkets. And even then, they're only crime spots because it's where things are reported regularly, yeah. if yeah. they are reported, which is a distinction between that and actual significant crime, right? We have to use our judgment and not just have stats-based responses to things. I think that what we need much more of now, we need a, a Festival of Britain type approach of 
uh, almost like creative destruction, but a, a celebration and approach of what's possible for the future in Britain, right? Of which hospitality and tourism is very dynamic examples of what's possible, of innovation, of bringing new things. You have to be new all the time, right? What's so good about hospitality and clubs and bars is that you can't rest on your laurels. People want to sit, they want the sound system to be the new thing. They want the next music. Who's the DJs? What's the fashion? I want these cocktails now. You've got, you. the pressure the creative is- creative environment. It's brilliant, right? Because you cannot rest on your laurels. You cannot just leave it. And we need that much more in Britain, right? We need that in engineering. We need that in um, IT and biomedicine. We need it uh, in AI. And we've got a lot of it, right? We've got some brilliant intellectual business, but we've also got a sluggishness, right? We've had a problem with productivity in the last few decades. We've had this terrible impact of lockdowns and restrictions. I think we've had a perfect storm of a kind of impacts that now are really shedding light on the fact that our productivity is a problem. And I think that what we need is to have a proper plan that engages the public, right? That says, on the one hand, the government is going to support certain things, right? Like, you know, big infrastructure projects, bonds, make an opportunity for business. Not not overreaching, but providing the, the context for when things are just too much sometimes for private capital. And have entrepreneurs go out and do it. And when things fail, let them fail. Actually, encourage failure. <laughs> Sounds mad. but no, that's true. But then provide the safety net, not perpetual not perpetual benefits, provide a safety net and retraining and have a dynamic response to innovation, right? And celebrating what we do best. We really, like entrepreneurs should be at the front, forefront of when we're doing trade shows. I've always said that some of our hospitality people, we should be the ones that are being introduced to people around the world. But we need a kind of new approach that says that Britain, come here. It, this is what's so exciting about what we're doing. You know, try, try, fail, try, try. In America, they have a much better attitude to failure as well. Mm. I, when I lost my first company here. I was devastated. Everyone's almost, almost like, that's it forever. And you're really young. And until some, you know, people start saying to me, this is great because you learn all the problems and you do it again. And you know, we won't make the same mistakes again and you'll be better and we need to inculcate that sense of what's possible we need to have a much more dynamic response and i just don't see it in the main parties any of them no one wants to really talk about productivity you know on the one hand they either want to talk about wage wages or they want to talk about cuts i think as it happens they're both important but we really need to have a kind of short-term medium-term long-term approach and the short-term approach for hospitality is definitely to release some of the licensing we need to like go back on vat i think for the public we need to, to restore to emergency levels of vat that you had during lockdown. i think so i think we also need to for the public we need to you know get rid of green taxes and, and vat as well for this period i i think i mean I, you you know a lot about all of this but these next two years years look like they're going to be very problematic and i don't want to be a catastrophist because sometimes all these discussions because you're an overwhelmingly positive person <laughs> well but you have to be realistic right we've got a situation where in the middle of the summer all our energy prices have doubled and food price has been going up and this is happening way before what was going on in ukraine right this is a trend that has been developing and if you talk to small businesses now Many of them are saying, we just can't, we're going to have to give the keys back. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I grew up doing negative equity in the 80s, right? Which is basically, for anyone who doesn't know, you buy a place and the interest rates are so high that you can't afford even to run it. And you have That's to right. kind of give it back. You lose your deposit. So your mortgage is for more than your house is worth because house prices fall. Exactly. And, and if you're renting a place or whatever now, you've got a situation where all your bills have gone through the roof and you cannot keep just offsetting it onto the punter because in the end, they'll just... So you've got, we've got a real really big issue i know people are talking about it they haven't admitted that it's the cost of lockdowns significantly but i think that's an important point to know but also it's not a blame game it's about taking responsibility saying you're not going to do that again if there's a problem with the nhs or anything this winter and also resolutions what are the solutions i mean there's some talk of nuclear of fracking but we've got tidal we could be energy independent and i think that if everyone if the people that want to give a lead took the same approach that entrepreneurs took and that our hospitality sector has done we could be in a position as much better and we're going to have to have some fortitude and commitment and courage because those things are difficult right but i think that's where we need to go alan miller you are a phenomenal advocate for british hospitality for british nighttime industries in general, it's been great talking to you here. Thanks for appearing on Thank Money Talks. Thank you, Liam. <laughs>